Um, we're very privileged to have this group here because we, here we've got some extraordinarily experienced people who are heavily involved with the industry in different angles, right? In different parts of the world. Uh, but we inserted this because we thought, you know, okay, we can report about mm -hmm. demand, we can report about the so forth. It was really important to step back and look at the big picture, right? And reflect on the big picture and say, you know, where do we think things are driving? Because you're not necessarily going to focus on pounds or capacity or whatever. So we're just going to have a general discussion, right? And of course, anyone who wants to, you know, raise their hand and say, I disagree with that, or here's an extra point, please do so. Because this, in a sense, is sort of a group uh, discussion. So I'll start out with the, uh, with, with the big picture questions. Um, each of you put on your, you know, your, your prediction hat or whatever it is, and try to describe what you think the chemical industry will look like 10 years from now, in any way you wish. You can describe it any way you wish, but and what, in what ways is it going to be different from the, from the way it is now? And do we're going to start out with you because you you have the most data. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, I tend to think capitalism kind of runs to the extremes, right? And so it would seem to me the big get bigger and the small, you know, they die. Uh, so what is consolidation? So I, I see on the commodity side, my perception would be. Uh, you grow in strength and size, uh, or you're bought up, or you, you go away. And then I think there's a movement. There's always every, there's always been. I want to go to specialties, but that's a special skill set as well. I think that's different. And then the others. Right? Then there's that specialty group that do really well what they do, and uh, and then there'll always be those that try to be there, but they can never make the change. Okay, all right. It might get to the ten year, but come on. Well, I, I think an industry would probably find itself uh, some sort of a new rebalance. There's a lot of pressure coming on sustainability sides, some of the we mentioned about uh, plastics, waste plastics, PT recycling. It's really one of the most easy issues. My own company, we recycle the largest quantity of the So, this is, I think, a similar change. But there will be some consolidation in the West Indies. The emergence from Middle East cannot be ignored. We will get into downstream for sure. And as I mentioned, in India, what's happening in our part of the world, I think the industry would not radically look very different. Maybe some readjustment that in terms of the right? well, so called green products can only be seen. So really it's gonna be what can any of down the line can you do away with what you're using now? The answer to me to I thought what the solid you were saying that has well, they purchased all the best specialty chemicals <laughs> and will control the European the good European specialty chemical is I think that's what you were gonna say, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I've given my perspectives on um, Europe and <laughs> to some extent also on the uh, chemical industry in North America and, and Asia. So I would like to get, put some new ideas on, on, on the floor. Um, I've been living in the chemical industry, said 30 years, and I have I've been in it. And this was a time where globalization was the name of the game. Mm -hmm. um, globalization, um, regionalization becoming leader in the region, then globalizing, entering the United States. In the last 10, 20 years, we've all been building capacities in China. Uh, and this thing is one that I uh, <coughs> uh, challenge. <coughs> and, and nobody of us can tell the story, um, but we see all the last five years where globalization entered into localization, regionalization. But there are tensions out there, you know, there are tensions on religion, there are tensions on global leadership, the United States versus China. 
And the likelihood that we are going to go into a world that uh, I have experienced in my first 10 years, where you had uh, basically uh, two systems, the East versus the West, and you had to decide which one you going to operate. The likelihood that we are going to have a situation like this again uh, has increased. And that will definitely impact also our, our industry. I mean, we have been global, we have global value chains. Uh, I, I know, I, I look into the products and I know when we're going to have trade wars mm -hmm. uh, or other industries will be massively surprised and dependent that they are on the global value chains that exist in the chemical industry. This can change the playing book of many of our companies from one day to the other. And as a matter of fact, I've given you the picture on when you see the industry and when you look at Europe with our strategic directions. <coughs> but, but that is a, a topic that is on my desk. And what I'm looking at as a kind of plan C or plan D, and we should at least be prepared for such a scenario. You know, it's interesting. My thinking is, is similar to yours in that you know, I think the it's not easy, but easier to predict things like um, the typical GDP growth in the U.S. or China and that sort of thing. The part that's difficult that could be very disruptive are geopolitical and political uh, because that affects everything. Regulation, tariffs, alignments, the light, we might be in line. We, see, we have the U.S. and Taiwan and we have China and India and we have these, it's breaking down into sort of groups. And you change a couple of things and it will dramatically change the global economic trade environment and immediately affect the chemical issue. Example, just Trump becoming president again versus Biden or someone else like that, that one thing alone has a dramatic effect on tariffs, trade, you know, all these things that in fact back up into the chemical industry here as to what it is. So, you know, in a sense, I'm saying, uh, uh, we can analyze the other stuff, right? You know, which is not easy, but a big part of all the leaders in, in the industry is to sort of say scenario, do the scenarios about, you know, you know, autocrats and Trump and everything else to say under different scenarios, what are those guys going to do that, and then what effect is going to happen? Because definitely the one thing I guess if Trump becomes, he's already said, okay, you know, isolation, you know, I'm going to build more, you know, tariffs and, and continue what I did the first time. And that has a major effect on the chemical industry versus if it was Joe Biden or something like that. Right? So, we went from Liger to leader on, on sustainability initiatives. Yeah. The current regime, that could change with the electric. Yeah, and you talk to a lot of leaders around the world and they say, boy, I just, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, in just the U.S. politics. Right? If I may, I mean, we, we cannot predict the world. Um, who, who could really uh, convey um, that suddenly we have war in the Middle East? I think even a extremely professional, the strong business intelligence, military intelligence system that uh, Israel had, they missed it. They missed it. Yeah, they missed it. I think they're always extremely uh, <coughs> advanced in this field not, and, and now we are confronted with this. So, uh, our industry might be severely yes. confronted with this as far as input costs are concerned and impact uh, But my learning out of the last um, basically three years where we have the volatility uh, coming from all sides. The learning for me in how look now into the next five, ten years, I don't expect that volatility, I don't expect that external disruptions will become less. Mm -hmm. We will be at the same level or could even get worse. The one learning I take out of that, and that is for me also when I look into in our company to the next two, three, four years, at the end of the day, we need to rethink our organizational structures. 
we need to rethink the DNA of our people, uh, and we need basically agility in that and organizational structures that allow in a very short period of time to adjust. You know, in Germany, especially, we are always known for these rigid organizational structures, hierarchy, process, standardization, la 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 la. I don't think that this is the recipe for success. The recipe for success is mindset, uh, empowerment of people, intrinsic motivation, and a structure that allows for extremely fast reaction. So this is a little add on to the volatility that we all are confronted with. Yeah, it's like you put a shocker over a football you know. They run down it, but then they react based on what people are doing and they make a move and that well, that's what a good soccer player, a good football team does. They don't just say, well, I was told just to run this way and so I'm going to keep running this way no matter what, right? Because that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's not going to happen. But you're right, this, the, the situation with Gaza, who knows what would happen with that, right? But you know, there are also some things that are happening that indirectly will have an impact on all of AI. Yeah. AI is going to affect everything. You just can't predict exactly what's going to happen, right? But it's going to affect everything, good and bad. So, but it will have an effect on chemicals, right? Because depending on what, what it does, it will affect demand and orders and, and, and these other things, right? So it's, uh, it's interesting. Another question. Uh, next 10 years, where do you think will be some R&D or innovative breakthrough that will have an impact on the chemical industry? I'll mix up the orders. I won't pick on you, Dewey. We'll start with come on. I'm, I'm pretty sure some lab somewhere, something's happening. If you don't know where, what is I know, <laughs> something has to happen. It took uh, quite, quite too long to look at the technology. We saw somewhere something is happening. But, uh, will it fundamentally change our industry? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think we basically the products that we deal with are currently there for you. Unlikely they just disappear. Probably some of the products may come under pressure. Uh, I'm pretty sure that industry, somewhere, somebody's working on this. Something. The 10 years from when you'll go back and say, oh, that was a big, big change. Well, I think, um, I mean, we, we ran this analysis in our st strategy uh, process. Um, I don't think that, that that none of us will find new elements. These days are over. I mean, we have, over the last 10, 20 years, lived with the current elementary chemical system. Uh, what has changed is how molecules are being used. And uh, I, I, I give you one example. We have a, a product that for the last 50 years has been used in the paper coatings, and construction industry. This is a iron oxide business. Um, so the same application. And what suddenly surfaces that the iron oxide can be used in battery technology. We are not there yet, but we are running tests with uh, two big OEM companies, and therefore a molecule or a, a chemical um, you know, synthesis product that was for fifty years in standard application might be entering into a completely different application, be a booster, also to replace a scare raw material, which is called cobalt, right, right. Uh, which is currently only largely produced in one place, in one place with uh, labor uh, abuse everywhere, etc., etc., and is detrimental to the electronics industry. And, and this might be a complete innovation on a standard molecule that exists for 50, 60 years. And my assumption is we are going to see the next wave of technology developing and enabling existing molecules going into different applications. And like cobalt and others, 
lithium, whatever, it would be interesting. The number of new technologies, with it solid state or salt based or sodium based, <clears throat> one of them break through. And boy, I would be scared to death to spend $2 billion on a battery plant that was based on lithium when five guys are working on a sodium more solid state. You know, it, it's scary, right? right? I would like to give another example, yeah. which I think will drive the innovation cycle in, in chemicals. And this has to do with sustainability, um, carbon capture. And we have a product in our portfolio that enables the carbon capture process. Déjà vu. We never thought that this is feasible until a company approached us and said, we need your product because this thing is the nucleus of carbon capture. For what they were doing. For what they were doing, yes. Still top secret, so it's a development agreement. Blah, no, blah, blah. no one. Okay, reporters, so you're not allowed to report on. I did not. <laughs> I did not talk about our product. I did not talk about uh, their product. But these are chemicals, mm -hmm. and therefore, I mean, once we will not have in the plants the next element, the chemical mm -hmm. uh, elements system, I think all of us have products that can lead to technology change that all of us needs to have. Let it be recycling, let it be new applications. And therefore I think it will remain a fascinating industry uh, also for the years to come, of course with some dis disruptions here and there. And I really do think that you owe it to yourself as a running company to think ahead and try to adopt things early. I'll give you a simple example. We were absolutely convinced that the idea of flying people all over the place or to call on clients and to do project, it was a very inefficient way. It wasn't a cost, it's a huge, huge piece of time. So, well, you know, 2004, we started investigating every uh, online video conferencing system, and we kept testing and testing and testing. We were the first customer of Get which one yeah. WebEx, $12 an account. We kept testing, testing, and finally, nine years ago, we finally found one that we thought was adequate to meet all the criteria universality, no downloads, and so forth, and reliability, whatever, which was Zoom. Never, no one had heard of Zoom yeah. except for Zoom. We adopted it immediately before COVID or whatever, because we said, and we got a lot of our clients, like our clients in Brazil, so forth. We said, we don't want to fly. For them, just to fly from one office to another takes, them, you know, a day. And we started rolling it out and allowed our senior people to work with them. But that's what you need to do. You need to think ahead before it's obvious, right? And it hugely improved our efficiency and, and so forth. So that's what we do in all of these, uh, you know, and, and, and all these aspects. Okay, do we? Well, innovation. I love the idea of, of its new applications for existing molecules. I think we're not finding any other existing new elements. Uh, I'll give a very old history uh, example of that. Eastman, years ago, they were a polyester fiber manufacturer, basically. And then we saw Taiwan and China investing significantly in the polyester industry. And Eastman, within a year, invented, invented the first applications for bottles. And so the need drove it. It was like, what do we do with these assets and, and our people? And um, and the and I remember the initial bottles. They uh, there were the ugly two liter bottles with a foot on them. Uh, but that was a simple application design uh, that really kind of saved PD. Uh, and it just textiles remains a big application. And then I do think the other sector is carbon. I mean, we've greenhouse gases. Going from management to, uh, to to actually systems that address it and uh, the other reduction of the Now, does anyone in the audience want to either pose a question or make a statement about what they think the future is going to look like? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Obviously, a question. I, I first of all, great uh, great opportunity to. Have these kind of discussions. It's hard to even frame a discussion. There's so many degrees of freedom in the answer we use today. I tell my team, I wish we had the complexities of 10 years ago. This is what we have today. Uh, when we look 
look at uh, sustainability in terms of the environment, I think we can all agree uh, the, the world is aligned on where we're headed in terms of carbon footprint, circularity, etc. The issue is around pace, and, and more specifically around the pace that different governments around the world might legislate. And so I guess the question is, do you think that there will be differentiation in capital allocation around the world beyond the standard feedstock uh, cost curves that we look at every day and demand centers, all the traditional things? Do you think the pace of legislative drivers in this sustainability space will differentiate capital allocation uh, or to, to balance out the traditional views of how we allocated capital? I'll start when I think fundamentally our problem is it is game it's a game theory problem, which is for us to to solve this world well the and so forth requires that everyone work together. And all this stuff about cop to it the, the problem with it is they don't have a system that penalizes people who behave badly, right? Nothing's going to cause the Chinese not to use coal, right? And yet, that's if everybody does what they're supposed to, and the Chinese don't. You know, it, 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 it's not to solve the problem, right? So you can talk about individual legislation within each country, but the reality is something like that, right? Is one the only way you solve it is if the everyone, you know, if everyone you know, agrees, right? The analogy I have is like you take 10 people to the restaurant and you say, we're going to split the bill. Everyone orders the lobster, right? Right? Because there's no penalty. But you don't have the vested interest in lowering the average cost. Of everyone, everyone assumes the other guy is going to order the lobster, right? So they all order the lobster. And the, and the, and the cost per person when they divide it is, is very expensive. But that, that's classic, right? That will happen 100% of the time. That's the way it is. So that's the problem with some of these things that they don't have something that it, that is across multiple countries, right? That creates a system of rewards and penalties that are enforceable to cause them. Because you can legislate all day long in your own country, but unless people, you know, cooperate, and it's not just global warming, it's lots of things, you know, recycling, whatever it is, it's hard to get there. That's my response. Well, I would argue that you should not only be in the smallpox, you can be in the world. Uh, you can take the environment that global is in through the Paris Accords and, and the outcome of that uh, global solution. I would argue today the world is in a much worse geopolitical shape trying to reach alignment. Uh, and so, can we get there? Hopefully, because everybody's got their eye on the, the prize, which is to do the right thing. But it feels to me like there's going to be a lot of Piece of differences in terms of that, that differentiation, and I'm just curious how much that will have to bear on when capital allocation is as we make decisions. You know, just from a gaming perspective, we call it tragedy of the commons. Yeah, this is doing it's a classic, it's a classic case, yeah, yeah. right? And we were all we were all talking about energy transition until we need to talk about energy scarcity and security of Europe right after the Ukraine Russia uh, conflict. So. Um, yeah, you know, things are always changing. I, and, and our plastic service, um, we we look at all the metrics, but the most important thing the class want to know, we follow policy across all the countries where they are in plastics regulation. And we talk about, we have a metric of from aspiration to regulation. And that's the most com that's the most sought after analysis is what's every country doing and where are they in that whole place? Because I mean, when companies build ahead of the policy and then regulations come in later, if you miss the bull eye, you've wasted money, right? Yeah. So it, you have to make sure you don't get too far ahead of where the regulation is. So I you have a response to this. Well, I think the, the cost of capital, you know, I was a financial institution. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes and says, you know, we want to build a large petroleum contract. Obviously, I don't understand this one, but I think they they won't be in the push. New, new chemical plants are not going to be as easy in terms of raising capital as has been in the past. Except Middle East, where it is definitely enormous capital available to do it. I think that rebalancing will end 
Yeah. Yeah, well, I think this question was stemming from when the trends in the world change capital allocation. I think they do that all the time. But when capital allocation um, we will do it in a way to uh, to, 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 to to put that on a global scale and to optimize for the needs of the of the world. I have my question marks. I mean, let's 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 look into one situation where I thought uh, that the world might learn, uh, and that was Corona pandemic. Uh, my assumption at that point in time was when the virus broke out and when we saw all those pictures on the television, my assumption was that the pharmaceutical industry around the globe will interact and when they find this cure to Corona, we will globally scale up. It didn't happen. China had vaccines and making sure that Sinovac is being distributed in China. The Russians had their combination, the Germans, the Americans, and eventually, of course, the vaccines were available globally. But have we found one vaccine that was dispatched globally worldwide to say, oh God, that would have been best making use of capital allocation. It didn't, it didn't work out. And if, if, if we now go to the next problem that, that I think is systematic and systemic for our world, uh, next to making sure that people don't bomb each other and, and kill each other, I mean, is, is can we protect this world? And that means climate change, and at the end of the day, we need only to get the three, four superpowers in the world on one table, and this is not happening. And what we need most likely, and this is very, very sad, to have again a disruption a massive disruption that leads to the fact that all the four superpowers sit behind the table and agree on capital allocation, agree on energy, and agree on priorities for the world. And as long as this is not happening, I think that capital allocation, as it's done today, is not going to change. And I, I do think we, we, we have a structural problem with the game issue, right? In other words, we don't have in place a political and legislative and multilateral system that causes people to naturally do the right thing. And the analogy that I give for my, when I was at Lehman and its own, if you uh, just get, you know, when travel, you had to fill out an expense report, staple all of the expenses. There's a giant manual that's there. What hotel you can play at, what hotel you can, when could you, how many miles did you have to travel before you could, before you could travel business class letter, which nobody read, and then you, or they would take, they had an army of accountants who would analyze all these things, go back, say, oh, you violated this rule, you have to resubmit it, so forth. It's a stupid system, right? Instead, so when we started young partners, I said, we have a simple rule. If it's a, if, we will reimburse, you can submit your expense report, staple the deal, we won't even look at it, and we'll reimburse you 90% of whatever you submitted. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Now, what happens? First of all, I don't have an army of accountants reading all this stuff. The second is, you will not believe what even a managing director will do to save 10%. Mm -hmm. A trip to Houston, what, $1,600? They will do, oh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that I'm going to make that trip. So I make a non-refundable <laughs> ticket for a lot of, it's amazing what these people will do for $160, right? And more importantly, they ask the question, is that trip a worthwhile trip? And that by itself. And I remember I sat next to a very senior guy at Goldman Sachs. He said, you know, you guys, I'm very irritated with your firm because we did an analysis and you were working for almost every major German chemical company, and you don't have an office in Germany. And so I said, well, you know, and it, you know, a blind, blind squirrel occasionally. He said, no, 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 that's not the answer. <laughs> he said, tell me something that you do that makes your, your firm more efficient 
that we, that we do. I'll tell you something we do that you will never do. And I told them the story about the fencing. He said, wow, that's very elegant, but you're right, we'll never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think the world, we have a structural problem, just like the US political system, we have a structural problem, right? We have a government system that was designed to manage 13 states where you could wait three weeks to declare war because that's how long it took for a ship to get across the Atlantic. It doesn't work anymore, so now it's all messed up. So we've got to find a way to change the system, I think, uh, so that people will then behave the right way. But by the way, I think Elon Musk gave us a hint as to how he had this attitude about how things are going one way. Why do you think he wants to go to Mars, right? <laughs> <laughs> to get away from all this, right? So look, I, 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 first of all, I really want to thank our speakers. I, I think, I hope you agree they did a wonderful job. And I hope our goal has been achieved, which is you walk away with two or three insights that you didn't have before you came here, that you can apply to your business and how you make decisions. If, if we've accomplished that, then I think it's been a good conference, plus some good food, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank all of you for uh, here, and they, we made about, uh, about 10 people who are online as well. They didn't speak up much, but they were online. And, uh, I, and I, I will let you know when uh, next year's uh, event is, but I want to thank all of you, and thank you for the great questions you've asked.